Is anybody in this room named Toby? Probably not, but you've known that that is a name that's around like Toby Tyler or Edna. Ever known a lady named Edna? There are Ednas around. Well, I'll tell you where these names come from. They're not in the Bible. They're from the Apocrypha. Because once upon a time, when the northern tribes of Israel had been taken into captivity in Assyria, the Jews living in Assyria, some of them who were very diligent and hardworking, rose to high positions in the Assyrian court. And one of those men was named Tobias. Tobias became the official purchaser of goods for the Assyrian king. But Tobias was a very devout man, and so he used all of his wealth to take care of all the poor Jews who were over there in Assyria. And he did all kinds of good for his people. And the book of Tobit is designed to show us how to be a good person like Tobias. Well, one day the old king of Assyria died, and there was a new king. And he was not as favorable to the Jews, and he had a bunch of them killed for some reason. And he ordered that their bodies be left exposed. But Tobias went out at night and buried them all so that they wouldn't be left out in violation of the law. And as a result, the king punished him and put him out of office and reduced his situation considerably. Now, he was able to get some help from a nephew of his named Ahikar. Ahikar is a very famous person in the ancient world. He shows up in a bunch of stories. There are books about Ahikar. He even shows up in the Tales of a Thousand Nights and One Night or Arabian Nights, or Tales of Scheherazade, or whatever you want to call that. He doesn't show up as a Jew, except in Tobit, but he does show up as an important functionary and a very wise man and clever in dealing with the kings of whatever nation he is in. So there is some root of history here that's at least being tied in in this tale. Well, a Ahikar, who in this version is a nephew of Tobit, prevents him from being put to death and helps him a little bit with the king. But just to make matters worse, Tobias is outside one day. He looks up and a bird flying by drops bird dookie into his eyes and he goes blind. So now he's in a bad way. Doesn't have any money. Looks like God's against him. And he remembers that over in the nation of Media, in the city of Ecbatana, He's got a bunch of money, and now he needs money, and a lot of the poor people that he's been helping need him to get money. He's like Job, you know. Job, the king of Edom, talks about how when he was wealthy, all the poor people had money and were taken care of. Well, Tobias is an example of a good Jew. He's up high in the government. He makes lots of money, and he helps all the other Jews with it, which is what he ought to do. So over in the nation of Media, he's in Assyria. Media is here. Got that real clear in it. Okay, our imaginary map. In Ecbatana, he's got money. So he sends his son Tobit to go to get this money. And he prays that God will take care of Tobit along the way. Well, along the way, Tobit is met by a man who is really an angel named Raphael. And Raphael says, Oh, you're going to Ecbatana? So am I. Well, let's go together. So along the way, they're fishing. And they get a fish out of the water, and Raphael says, I want you to save that fish. I want you to save the heart and the liver and the gall out of that fish. And the fish don't necessarily have all these things, but I want you to save those things. This is a miracle fish, because you may need them later on. So Tobit actually does so. Meanwhile, over in Ecbatana, an old friend of Tobias's named Raguel and his wife Edna have a beautiful girl named Sarah. Guess where this story is going? Well, Sarah has been married seven times. And every time on the wedding night, before anything can happen, an evil demon named Asmodeus kills her husband. So Asmodeus the demon is out to make sure Sarah never gets married. And that's bad because, you know, this isn't Roman Catholicism where, you know, perpetual virginity is a good thing. This is biblical religion where a girl wants to get married and have a husband. So Asmodeus, the evil demon, is forcing her to stay a virgin against her will, and she can't have a husband. 
Well, how are we going to deal with that? Well, when Tobit comes over to Ecbatana, he stays with Raguel and his devout family, and he meets Sarah, and of course, they hit it off. Of course, he's warned about the demon. But Raphael tells him what to do. He says, I want you to take the heart and the liver of that fish, and I want you to burn them up and turn them into smoke on your wedding night. And when the demon Asmodeus smells it, he'll run away and never bother you anymore. And so he does, and he does. Then they can be married and be happy. And that gets rid of the demon. And then they go back here with the money to Tobias and Anna. And Raphael says, now as, as regards your dad, when you see him, I want you to take the gall, the urine of this fish, and sprinkle it in his eyes, and that will enable him to see again. So he does, and he does. And that's the end of the story. Isn't that great? Now, what this story is about, okay, it's about the reward for faithfulness. Throughout the book, if you were to read it, there are lots of prayers. There's emphasis on charity. Then there's emphasis that God rewards faithfulness. And if you're faithful, you may become rich in the king's court, but the demands of faithfulness may mean that you lose your position. But God has ways of taking care of you. And, of course, it's a fantasy story, and there are fantasy elements in it. It's what we would call a romance. But that's the message of it. And Tobit is a very popular book in the church and traditionally in marriage services and the like. You'll hear references to Tobit in some of the older marriage literature and some of the prayers and the emphasis on charity to the poor are important in this book. It seems to be an early story. Whether any of it's true, no one knows. But it could well be that these men actually existed and as Jews and had high positions over there in Assyria and media at this time, but that these additional stories have grown up around them. Well, if we look down at the bottom of page two, let's kind of look at some of the other parts of the Apocrypha. I've got down here, first of all, edifying fiction, and we've looked at a couple of those. Then there's pseudo-historical works. first one I would mention is the prayer of Manasseh. Who wants to remind the class who Manasseh was? Did I see your hand go up? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> well, he was one of Joseph's sons, and that could be, but that's not it. You were right. <laughs> he was the king in the days of Isaiah, and he was an extremely wicked king and idolater, and he repented toward the end of his life. And the prayer of Manasseh is a fictional work that is supposedly his prayer. It's a very fine piece of work. I mean, it's not as good as reading Psalm 51, of course, which is inspired by God. But if you want to read a good prayer, this is a good one. It's very short. It's one page long. Let's see if I can read part of it to you. For the sins I have committed are more in number than the sand of the sea. My transgressions are multiplied, O Lord, they are multiplied. I am unworthy to look up and see the height of heaven because of the multitude of mine iniquities. I am weighed down with many an iron fetter so that I am dejected because of my sins, and I have no relief. For I have provoked thy wrath and done what is evil in thy sight, setting up abominations and multiplying offenses. But now I bend the knee of my heart, beseeching thee for thy kindness. I have sinned, O Lord, I have sinned, and I know my transgressions. I earnestly beseech thee, forgive me, O Lord, forgive me. Do not destroy me with my transgressions. Do not be evil with me forever, or lay up evil for me. Do not condemn me to the depths of the earth. For thou, O Lord, art the God of those who repent. So, it's fine stuff. Like most of the Apocrypha, well worth your reading and considering. Another book that you'll find in the Apocrypha is the book of Baruch. Who is Baruch? Yes, sir. That's right. He's a scribe of Jeremiah. He shows up in Jeremiah, a lot of things about him in that book. And the book of Baruch is, again, a fictional book, not actually by him, or if it is by him, it's not part of the Bible. And I've got a little outline of it here. It's interesting to read. It gives you a little slant on how the Jews thought about the exile at this time. We also have another piece called the Letter of Jeremiah, which attacks the false gods of Babylon. 
and is probably written around 300 B.C. as a warning against syncretism. And who wants to remind us of what syncretism is and how we get that word? Do you remember? Yes, ma'am? Yep. How would you break syncretism down? Somebody said, what does that word mean? Right. Sin is with. Okay. Together with, and cre as in credo, or credible, or credence, or any of our words in English that come from that Latin root, belief. Okay, mixture of beliefs. And that's what this letter of Jeremiah is about. Then we have a book in here called First Esdras. And it's also called Third Ezra. What is Second Ezra? This is a good question. Your Bible has it. Your Bible has the book of Second Ezra, but it's not called that in our Bibles. Who knows? Some of you should know this. I'm ashamed. Hezekiah? Yeah. Yes, sir? Mm -mm. That's close. Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Right. Ezra and Nehemiah is one book. It's on one scroll. And Nehemiah is also called Second Ezra. Okay, Third Ezra. It just retells the book of Ezra with some additions. Nothing particularly wrong with it, but nothing particularly great about it either. And then a final thing that we have in this aspect of the Apocrypha are the additions to Esther. And you'll remember that in the book of Esther there's no mention of God anywhere. And so somebody decided, well, let's stick in some visions and prayers and other things to make Esther better. So that's what it does. And one thing it does do is it justifies Mordecai's disobedience to the king, it tries to portray him as righteous in doing that. And I think that the presence of this material has deflected a proper interpretation of the book, which proper interpretation you heard a couple of months ago from Pastor Snyder. And Mordecai is clearly in sin and brings on this judgment that then is changed. Then another group of books we can call historical propaganda. First, second, and third Maccabees. The first and second Maccabees is traditionally in the Apocrypha. Third and fourth Maccabees are books that are similar enough that in expanded editions of the Apocrypha, like this one, they're included. And they're interesting, or at least third Maccabees is. What is the first book of Maccabees? Well, remember from our history that the Jews in Jerusalem apostatized from their faithfulness to God in the days just before Antiochus Epiphanes. And they converted the city into a Greek city. And the priests and the aristocracy, the Tobias, the descendants of Tobias, who was given a room in the temple and who Nehemiah kicked out, well... His descendants were around, and once again, they're given rooms in the temple, and the city apostatizes. And so God brings in Antiochus Epiphanes to punish them, and they repent. So God raises up judges to kick them out. This is just like the book of Judges. Over and over again, this is the story. And the judges, in this case, some country priests, are the Hasmoneans, and one of the Hasmoneans named Judas was called... Maccabee, which means what? Hammer. All right. So they're also called the Maccabees. Hasmoneans or Asmoneans. Now what these guys did was initially they did good and they pushed away Antiochus Epiphanes. They got some freedom for Israel. Then they sinned. What are the two sins they committed? They did not restore the true high priest. And instead they what? They took it over for themselves. What's the second thing they did that they were not supposed to do? They made themselves a line of kings. Okay. Now, we have two books about this. The first one is First Maccabees, and it's basically a political tract designed to justify these sins. It's designed to justify the Hasmonean Maccabean usurpation of the high priesthood and kingship, and presents them as new Davids who are faithful to God and who write psalms, and it's all kind of based around this. You've got these psalms in here and everything designed to show this. And it carries down the history. It really says very little about the sins of the Jews in bringing about this judgment. It says, some Jews sinned. 
And then Antiochus Epiphanes came in, and it's really all his fault. And we drove him out, and it carries you down through several generations of these kings designed to show how it was right and good for them to make themselves high priests and kings. It just kind of fell into their lap, and after all, what could they do about it? So it's very much like the kinds of books that you'll see for sale later this year. There will be a biography of George Bush for sale. It talks about how great he is and all the great stuff he did. And there will be a biography of Kerry, won't there? I can't imagine it will be anybody else. Talk about all the great stuff he does. You know, these are election year political books designed for people to read so that you vote for this guy and you think, he's great. Look at all the great stuff he did and what a wonderful father and husband and veteran and all the rest he is. So that's kind of what this book is like. And although it has historical information in it, we have to remember that it has a slant. I don't think that this is a particularly edifying book in the Apocrypha. It's interesting, it's not as edifying. Second Maccabees, on the other hand, is. Second Maccabees lays the blame on the Jews for the destruction that Antiochus brought. He is seen as God's agent to punish them, and in fact, uh, 2 Maccabees has him repenting and turning to God on his deathbed. That's probably not true. It's probably not quite as historically accurate in some ways as 1 Maccabees, but it has a much better perspective on things. It does not go beyond that first generation and the victories in battle. It doesn't go down several generations in the Maccabean line, and so it makes no comment on their usurpation of the high priesthood and kingship. It focuses on the temple and it's ruined by the Jews and then by Antiochus, and then it's restoration. It's actually a summary of a much longer work that's lost. He talks about it in here, about the third chapter. I forget where it comes up. But he says, I am writing an epitome, that is a summary, of the five or seven volumes of this other guy. But we don't have that, unfortunately. It would be nice to have this longer work. Why do you suppose... Something like this would be written, a summary of a book that originally was on five scrolls. Not for stupid people who couldn't read very fast. How expensive was papyrus? How many people could read? Did they have a printing press? No. If you wanted to get this out, and it's, it's a big, huge, long book, you want to get the information out, you make a shortened version of it so that more people can get hold of it. It would be very expensive to copy out the whole original long thing, you see. So you get these summary things like this in the ancient world. Yeah, it's kind of like cliff notes. Then we have a book called Third Maccabees, which is not about the Maccabees at all. It describes an earlier event in history. Remember... On our timeline here, our invisible timeline, we have this apostasy of the Jews and Antiochus Epiphanes and the coming of the Maccabees and they're taking over everything. That's around here. Well, a couple of generations or so earlier than that, when the Jews were under Greek Egypt, we have an event when Ptolemy IV Philopater attempted to enter the temple and was repulsed and then attacked the Jews in Egypt as a result. What these kings always wanted to do was get inside the temples, and it usually wasn't a problem. The other gods didn't mind if the emperor went into their temple, but the Jews had a problem in that nobody was supposed to go in there except the high priest. So when the emperor came to town and said, I'd like to go in the temple, they said no, and they managed to push him off and prevent him from doing so. Obviously, being the emperor with his army, he could have forced his way in, but he didn't. He just got mad, and he went home and took it out on the Jews in Egypt. Why did these emperors always want to go into the temples? Not just in Israel, but everywhere. No, not to make themselves little gods. Yes, sir? The treasures. Temples were the places where a huge amount of treasury was kept in all these things. People gave stuff to the gods and the priests had it. You read in Chronicles about the description of the temple, it talks about the treasuries and the treasurers. And of course, as you've heard in the history recently, 
the priest took big hunks of that treasure to Antiochus Epiphanes and said, hey, we want you to kick out Onias III. Let us kick out Onias III and let us be the high priest. And he said, sure, thanks for the dough. And then a few years later, another priest did it. There was lots of money in these places. And so whenever the emperors wanted to raise money, they would raid the temples. And that's basically what Ptolemy wanted to do. He was in conflict, always a conflict between Egypt and Syria with Israel in between. You know, this army would be defeated, and then they'd have to raise money by raiding all the temples. And he'd come down here and defeat the Egyptian army, and then they'd have to raise money by raiding all the temples. And then they'd send an army up here and defeat the Syrians, and they'd be defeated. Then they'd have to raise money by raiding all the temples and build their army back up. This is the way it goes, okay? So he wants to get money out. Well, he goes back to Egypt because he doesn't get it, and he's mad. And then in the story of this book, Eleazar, an aged priest, prays and Ptolemy is converted and turns to favor the Jews of Egypt. This is an orthodox work. It's fun reading, designed to encourage the Egyptian Jews to remain faithful to God in the midst of these things. And, of course, this was a problem. Jews in Egypt were very much inclined to mingle in with the other religions. They were very syncretistic. Well, another kind of book you have in the Apocrypha or the extended version of it is 4th Maccabees. And all it is is a piece that uses the stories of the Maccabees and those events as a way of talking about philosophical ideas, particularly of a Stoic sort. And it's not orthodox. I need a Trinity hymnal, somebody. Hand me one of those. Now we come to some of the better stuff. Orthodox Jewish wisdom. We have in this a book called The Wisdom of Solomon, or it'll just be referred to as Wisdom. And it's a devout work by an Orthodox Alexandrian Jew in Egypt. He draws some from Greek ideas, but absorbs them with the biblical view of wisdom. So if you read it, it's a lot like Proverbs. Let's see if I can just find it. Well, it's not so much like Proverbs, but it talks about wisdom and serving God and so forth. I'm not going to go into it. The most important book of the Apocrypha is the book of Ecclesiasticus. That's the older name. Nowadays, it's called, by its Jewish name, the wisdom of Ben Sirach, or Sirach. What does Ben Sirach mean? Son of Sirach, not Ben Sirach, okay? Not Benjamin Sirach, but son of Sirach. Ecclesiasticus, you see it referred to, it will be written like this. Okay, so if you see a reference to ECCL, that's what book? That's Ecclesiastes. Ecclus is Ecclesiasticus. So you will occasionally see that if you read much in, you know, if you have a book of common prayer, for instance, and you're looking at the appointed lessons, occasionally there'll be a reading from Ecclesiasticus. That means the church book. It was the most important book for the church, most used by the church historically. In other words, out of the Apocrypha, this is the one the church used a lot. And a whole lot of it is Proverbs. In fact, the bulk of it is. It's a long book. And there are interesting Proverbs in here. Let's see. Chapter 26 I've got down here. There's some good ones. Okay. Happy is the husband of a good wife. The number of his days will be doubled. A loyal wife rejoices her husband, and he will complete his years in peace. A good wife is a great blessing. She will be granted among the blessings of the man who fears the Lord. Whether rich or poor, his heart is glad, and at all times his face is cheerful. An evil wife is an ox yoke that chafes. Taking hold of her is like grasping a scorpion. There is great anger when a wife is drunken, and she will not hide her shame. A wife's harlotry shows in her lustful eyes, and she is known by her eyelids. Keep strict watch over a headstrong daughter lest when she find liberty she use it to her hurt. Be on guard against her impudent eye, and do not wonder if she sins against you. Okay? A wife's charm delights her husband, and her skill puts fat on his bones. And then the best proverb of the book, a silent wife is a gift of the Lord, and there is nothing so precious as a disciplined soul. A modest wife adds charm to charm. 
No, it's interesting that there's no equivalent chapter about husbands in this book. So it is <laughs> not inspired. I mean, most of this is just fine. Of course, this is true, except the silent part. But it has lots of wisdom here, and it's worth reading. I mean, you read books of Christian devotion and ideas. Might as well read some of these, too. I do want to read to you one other chapter here, or part of it. And that's from chapter 50. We get a very good description in this book of what temple worship was like in the period between the Testaments. And this is useful. He is celebrating here priest Simon, the high priest, the son of Onias. Now, this is Simon the second. He was the son of Onias the first. Now, Onias the third was the guy that was murdered. This is Onias the first. This is before the Maccabean time. Okay, Onias is the Greek form of the Hebrew word Johanan, which in the New Testament is what? Okay, equals Johanan or Johan, equals Johan, like in Johann Sebastian Bach. And in English, of course, we just never do anything right. It's John, okay? All the other languages of the world keep the original biblical pronunciation set for us. We don't say yes, Jesus, we say Jesus. We don't say Johan, we say John. We don't say Yaakov, we say Jacob. It's real strange, isn't it? It's weird to be an American. Well, at any rate, here's a description. The leader of his brethren and the pride of his people was Simon the high priest, son of Onias, son of John, who in his life repaired the house and in his time fortified the temple. He laid the foundations for the high double walls the high retaining walls for the temple enclosure, blah, 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 blah. When he put on his glorious robe and clothed himself with superb perfection and went up to the holy altar, he made the court of the sanctuary glorious. And when he received the portions from the hands of the priests, as he stood by the hearth of the altar with a garland of brethren around him, he was like a young cedar on Lebanon. And they surrounded him like trunks of palm trees, all the sons of Aaron in their splendor, with the Lord's offerings in their hands in front of the whole congregation of Israel. So you get this picture here. The high priest, all the priests around him, dressed in their robes of glory that the book of Exodus describes. Finishing the service at the altars and arranging the offering to the Most High, the Almighty, he reached out his hand to the cup and poured out a libation of the blood of the grape. He poured it out at the foot of the altar, a pleasing odor to the Most High, the King of all. Now, in the book of Numbers, we're told that they were to pour out a libation of wine when they did the grain offerings. We're not told where they poured it out. Here we find that at least this time in history, they understood to pour it out at the foot of the altar. Then the sons of Aaron shouted. They sounded the trumpets of hammered work, and they made a great noise to be heard for remembrance before the Most High. Then all the people together made haste and fell on the ground before their faces to worship the Lord. The singers praised him with their voices in sweet and full-toned melody till the order of worship of the Lord was ended. Then Simon came down and lifted up his hands over the whole congregation of the sons of Israel to pronounce the blessing of the Lord with his lips. What did he say? Did the Lord bless you and keep you? The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. That's the ironic benediction. And then we come to the most famous phrases in the Apocrypha, which you know. Okay, I've got it written down here. Now, bless the Lord of all, who in every way does great things, who exalts our days from birth and deals with us according to his mercy. May he give us gladness of heart and grant that peace may be in our days in Israel as in the days of old. May he entrust us to his mercy and let him deliver us all our days. Now, I'm going to read that to you again. And you listen. And every other line I read, you'll see. So just watch your page here. Now bless the God of all. Now thank we all our God, with heart and soul and voices, who wondrous things has done, in whom his world rejoices, who from our mother's arms has blessed us on our way, with countless gifts of love, and still is ours today. You see? Then the second stanza continues. Oh, may this bounteous God, through all our life, be near us, with ever joyful hearts, and blessed peace be near us, and keep us in his grace, and guide us when perplexed, free us from all ills in this world and the next. So, extremely familiar hymn, and it's based on this. Did you know that? 
How many of you know that hymn? Okay, goodness gracious. It's probably one of the 15 best-known hymns of the church. need to sing more hymns around here. Well, that felt kind of flat because I expected you all to recognize it. So that is a paraphrase of this section of Ecclesiasticus. And as I say, one of the best-known hymns of the church. Well, we'll have to move on. There's also what we call apocalyptic. Apocalyptic is stuff like you read in Ezekiel and Daniel, only it's more far out and weird. The book called Second Ezra, or Fourth Ezra, is like this. It is probably written after the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. It's written as a series of denunciations against Babylon, which means Rome, and it's visions by the angel Uriel about the mysteries of God's providence. It's not part of the original Apocrypha at all, but it's often included because New Testament scholars like to refer to it because it kind of gives a picture of what the Jews of Jesus' day thought, certain kinds of them. So it's in the expanded edition, and you can read it there if you want. Then we have two hymns, two hymns that have been used by the church from the beginning. And most parts of the church still use the prayer of Azariah and the song of the three children. These are additions to Daniel. Azariah, you remember, is one of the three friends of Daniel. And so when they were thrown into the fiery furnace, his prayer and then the song of the three young men in the fiery furnace, these have been sung by almost all of the church for centuries. I don't think there's a paraphrase of them in the Trinity, but that's no surprise because it was not written by people with much historical consciousness or care for that kind of thing. But most of the church sings them. They're perfectly fine. Let's see if I can find real quick. Bless the Lord, all you works of the Lord. Sing praise to Him and highly exalt Him forever. Bless the Lord, you heavens. Sing praise to Him and highly exalt Him forever. Bless the Lord, you angels of the Lord. Sing praise to Him and highly exalt Him forever. Bless the Lord, all waters above the heavens. Sing praise to Him and highly exalt Him forever. Bless the Lord, all powers. Sing praise to Him and highly exalt Him forever. Bless the Lord, sun and moon. Sing praise to Him and highly exalt Him forever. And so forth. It's pretty exciting. You sing it fast. Ha, ha, ha. Okay, so that's most of the Apocrypha. Of course, we haven't discussed all of it. You know, once upon a time, back when Daniel was living in Babylon and after the Persians had taken over, there was a big idol of Baal in the city. And King Darius came to Daniel and said, Well, you say that only Jehovah is the living God, your God of Israel, but Baal must be a living God because every day... We take all this food and we leave it in the inner room of the temple to Baal and we come back the next morning and the food is gone. And so obviously, Baal is a living God. He comes at night and eats the food. And Daniel says, <laughs> no, he's not. I tell you what, I'll prove to you that that's not what's going on. And the king says, all right. So Daniel says, let's go in there. And Daniel scatters ashes all over the floor around about after they put the food on the table. They put the food on the table for Baal to eat during the night, and then Daniel puts ashes all around, just a small covering of it. Then they go back. Well, the next morning, he and the king come in, and you know what they saw? Footprints all over in the ashes. And they tracked him down to a secret door by which the priests of Baal were sneaking in and scarfing down the doughnuts and prime rib that had been left for Baal every night. Well, that did not make the priest very happy. But then the king said to Daniel, Yeah, well, okay, but what about our dragon over here? We have this big dragon, and we worship him as a god, and he's certainly alive, and he eats the food, and you don't really want to mess with him, do you? And Daniel said, Daniel, dragon, big deal. He says, I tell you what, just let me feed that, dang, that dragon some food and we'll see. So Daniel makes a ball of pitch with hair mixed into it and fat. And he feeds pitch balls to the dragon. And suddenly the dragon exploded. <laughs> so there was lots of big gobbets of dragon meat eaten that night in Babylon. 
Well, that really made the priests mad because now the king said, Well, now I know there's only one living God. And the priests brought false charges against Daniel, and Daniel was cast into a lion's den for six days. And the lions were not fed to make sure that they would eat Daniel while he was in there. But God stopped the mouth of the lions, but the fact is Daniel got hungry. And he prayed to God and said, I don't want to starve in here. I haven't had any water, let alone food. So God looked over at the land of Israel and saw the prophet Habakkuk. Habakkuk was probably about 175 years old at this point. And Habakkuk had just finished making a whole bowl of broth to take out to the workers in the field, to take to the poor, and God snatched him up. God said to him, I want you to go over to Babylon and feed this food to Daniel. And Habakkuk said, it would take days to get there. And God said, no, it won't. So he picked him up by his hair and flew him over and deposited him at the mouth of the lion's den. And Habakkuk said, Daniel, Daniel. And Daniel said, yeah, I'm hungry. And so they lowered down the food and Daniel ate it. And God took Habakkuk back home. Well, of course, you know what happens then. The king came and saw that Daniel was still alive and that his God was the true God. And so he took all the evil priests of Baal and the dragon and threw them into the lion's den and the lions ate them all up. So now, if you're ever bothered by dragons, you know what to do. Now, what on earth is this about? I mean, it's fun, but it's got layers of meaning underneath, you know, like other things that we read. Okay, first of all, we're just telling our Jewish children, okay, this is a nice picture book for kids. There aren't any false gods. You can go around among the Gentiles and you can find that they claim to have gods that are alive and that eat the food of the temple, but it's all fake. Just like when you go to some Roman Catholic shrine and they say, we've got a bleeding statue here. Now, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain going, you know, it's a bleeding statue. Or it's a weeping icon in the Eastern Church. Oh, let's go and pray to the weeping icon. Look, it's weeping. You know. <laughs> you know, no, no, no. Don't pay any attention to that. It's all fake. And so, have a laugh at it. I mean, this is just ridiculous. Then again, there aren't any great dragons out there. You worried about dragons? Just obey the prophet and the dragons are going to go. Follow the prophet and you'll be eating dragon meat soon enough. Okay? What does the prophet tell you to do? He tells you not to pay any attention to it. He tells you to be faithful to God. You may get thrown into a lion's den, but God can bring Habakkuk with food to take care of you if you are, if that's what he wants. Okay? Obey the prophets. Pay no attention to false gods. Follow Habakkuk. Follow Daniel. Read those books. And you'll be fine. Okay? So that's the story of Daniel and Bel, which is short for Baal, and the dragon. Now, I guess before we stop, I will say something about pseudepigraphical writings, and we will almost finish all this material up today. This is on the bottom of page four. Pseudepigraphical writings, or the pseudepigrapha. What does that mean? Pseud means false, as in pseudo, you know. And epigrapha means writing. Writings falsely ascribed to biblical authors. The book of Baruch would be an example of that too in the wisdom of Solomon. They're not by Baruch, not by Solomon. The letter of Jeremiah would be. But they're higher class literature. This is kind of low class stuff. The Jews did not regard these books as authoritative in any way. This was not regarded as edifying religious literature. It's more like Harlequin romances of a different sort. You know, if the Apocrypha is the Shakespeare and the Dickens of Jewish literature, the Pseudepigrapha is pulp fiction of ancient Jewish literature. It's not serious. But you can find copies of it that's usually called something like the Lost Books of the Bible. And it's got the Book of Adam and Eve and all this stuff in it. It's, it's set up to look like a Bible in double columns and all this. And if you just want to read some junk, there it is. And here I've just got listed for you what is usually found in it. Now, this is kind of an open-ended category because there's always more junk out there. This is Old Testament pseudepigrapha. There's also New Testament epigrapha. 
Okay? We have the Acts of Paul and Thecla. We have the Gospel of Thomas. We have stories about Jesus when he was a little boy. You know, how he made a bird of clay and breathed on it and the bird flew away. And there are all kinds of little books of garbage like that. It's called New Testament Pseudepigrapha, the Gospel of Peter and other stuff. What is the Old Testament stuff? And you can just see a list of it here, the kind of stuff it is. The Book of Enoch, which is the one book that's taken more seriously and is a little bit more revealing about the thought of the Jews in the time of Jesus. But then we have the secrets of Enoch and the apocalypse of Baruch and the rest of Baruch and the assumption of Moses. It's how Moses' body was taken up into heaven. Some people think that that's quoted in the New Testament where it says Satan fought over the body of Moses in Jude. They say that, well, that's because the Jews believe that after Moses died, God took his body up into heaven and that Satan fought over the corpse of Moses. And they go to the book called The Assumption of Moses here. Assumption means the taking up. The taking up of Moses. And they say that's what it refers to. That's not what Jude is talking about. When Jude says, if you're taking notes and if you want to jot this down, the references are going to be Jude. I didn't write it down, so now I've got to find it. Okay. Jude, verse 9. But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But that is not talking about Michael and Satan fighting over Moses' corpse. What is it talking about? What's the body of Moses? What's the body of Christ? What's the body of Moses? Israel. Okay. And what is this passage referring to? Anybody know? Anybody want to shout it out at us before I get there? All right. It's referring to Zechariah chapter 3. And Zechariah chapter 3 is exactly what's being quoted here. So that's what's being referred to. And here we see Zechariah 3 says, In the vision he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who was chosen at Jerusalem rebuke you. So, Joshua the high priest, this is after the exile. They're trying to rebuild the temple. Satan wants to keep control of the situation. He is making all these accusations and he is rebuked. They're fighting over the body of Moses. They're fighting over the Old Testament church. Okay. Doesn't have anything to do with Moses' physical body going up into heaven. The assumption of Moses though, says that he did. So people get confused with this, and you'll read liberal commentators will try to draw you off to this. Well